Muito bem-vindos ao Continue in English. Welcome to our second session of Escola das Artes Open Classes of 2022. I am today very, very honored to embrace the challenge of both presenting and hosting Ulrich Bayer session. Welcome. Thank you very much for your presence. It's an honor uh, for us to have you here. Um, embrace the challenge in the sense that, to be fair with Ulrich Bayer, intellectual, research, artistic, training, activities, it means that there's no presentation that might be actually uh, enough to suffice. The typical presentation with an operative division into areas of activity as well as the clarification of fields of knowledge in which uh, Bayer writes and commits himself does not pay justice neither to the way um, Bayer proposes and embraces his work, neither to our vision here, respect and admiration for um, his labor. Nevertheless, Ulrich Bayer graduated in Harvard College and awarded a Master in Philosophy and a PhD in Comparative Literature in Yale. Teaches literature, photography and other topics at New York University. Directs the NYU Center for the Humanities. Has been awarded Guggenheim, Getty and Humboldt Fellowships and has written extensively on several topics on literature, photography, poetry, literary theory, political philosophy, and the memory of historical catastrophes. Has translated also literature, authored fiction, and directed or co-directed editions and classical editions. We were lucky enough to have Ulrich Bayer as keynote speaker last year on Spring Seminar 2021, Spectrology, Haunting and Ghosts. And by then, we already highlighted some of his publications, namely Spectral Evidence, The Photography of Trauma of MIT Press. But also several other publications, introductions on literature, translations, poetry, refer most of these publications and I continue on to referring to his list which is worthwhile um, following and accompanying. What I would like to recall um, today for this conversation is the fact that Yuli relates all his activities um, with the idea of transformative commitment that actively involves conversation, speech in action, hence calling into the center of those very same reflections the importance of language and its power, um, probably a key aspect that enlarges our admiration and inspires our School of Art projects. Um, having this framework in mind, it is also worth <clears throat> Sorry, to underline um, that besides his publications, including uh, single authored edited books, as I mentioned before, he's committed to education in a very broad sense. He has two podcasts, Free Speech, Think About It, and another one with Caroline Weber, Proust Questionnaire. questionnaire. Um, I would also like to add a YouTube channel, meaning a strong presence in social media, a familiar life, which you, you also recall into your work, a close contact with humans, gardens, even martial arts, deliberately blurring artificial lines, borders, and therefore questioning them between academia, popular culture, personal, professional life. To end, I would like just to quote from Ulrich Bayer's website where it stated that Ulrich Bayer is a writer, translator, and literary scholar who believes passionately in the transformative power of ideas and books and that real conversation plays a key role in our evolution as conscious, responsible, and compassionate people. I am therefore very honored to start this conversation, this real conversation with you today. Thank you, Rush. Obrigado. Sinto muito, não posso falar português, so I'm very sorry I can't address you in Portuguese. Um, but I want to thank 
uh, everybody here at the School of the Arts, first of all, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure. I was here last year virtually, so I think I saw some of you in the audience, maybe in this very room while I was sitting in my living room in New York. This is better. I prefer this, actually. <laughs> so thank you so much, Maria, for the introduction. Nunu, for inviting me. We've been longtime friends, so it's actually really wonderful to be in Porto uh, with you. And I, I thought I'd share some ideas today about the act of witnessing in photography. I know many of you are art students. I'm going to try to point out a few things of what could be an effective photograph. Like many of you, I presume, I'm also overwhelmed and kind of numbed by the images that we're seeing every day right now. I will allude to these images, and I will not be able to provide you with relief from these images or solace or solution, but I'm trying to think through what would be an active act of witnessing and how can photography help us to take some kind of action in our own lives. And I'll give you the example of two uh, world-renowned photographers, uh, Joseph Kudelka and Ernest Cole, I'll introduce him in a second, who were witnesses to history uh, in a profound sense. And uh, as Maria said, I really believe in dialogue and conversation. It's a little bit tricky in this room, but I really hope that I'll present some ideas, I'll show some pictures. Um, at any moment, if you feel like it, you can raise your hand or signal to me in any way. I'll be happy to slow down or say something or repeat it. I, I, I can prove I have a lecture written right here, but I don't like to read things because um, then I can't see my audience. And this is meant to be a conversation. We are trying to be in conversation. I actually, I'll say one thing about that, that it's vitally important that we make an effort to come to reach terms that we can mutually agree upon. Um, if you're listening to the news today, uh, what is happening in Ukraine is defined in two distinct ways by Russia and by Ukraine. And the definition matters greatly what's going on there. It is matters greatly whether you use the word war or defending the Ukrainian people or a limited military intervention, right? So what I'm interested in is how do we arrive at a shared term that parties who are on opposing sides can actually agree upon when what's at stake is the lives of people, the livelihood of people, and a lot of it depends on the right word in which to frame this. So my interest, as Maria said, is really I'm a scholar of literature and of photography, which, are cons which I consider very separate and distinct entities. I teach in the art school at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. I teach photography. And I also teach literature. Those are not the same thing. But I actually am quite interested how photography can maybe stage the tension or the irreconcil irreconcilable difference in commensurate realities in one image of two worlds that are colliding or in conflict. So I'll start right here. I don't know if this screen is on yet. So maybe, what do I have to do? Oh, let me see. Don't get the screen. OK, so this is my talk. Um, and everybody's comfortable. You're all fine. You're still wearing your masks, you're breathing. Okay, good, that's good, that's good to see. Um, so what I try to, I'm not gonna answer all these questions, but these are some of my guiding questions. What will be the difference between documenting an event, photographing what's in front of you, and bearing witness, which I consider a more engaged, active way of representing reality and seeing reality? How can we absorb images of atrocity without becoming numbed or overwhelmed. So we all want to know what's going on, but there's a kind of perhaps intentional overproduction of images that also is meant to kind of overwhelm and numb our responses. So where's the line between taking in enough information to know what's going on and taking in too much information that disables any kind of function, any kind of response you could have? And what would engaged seeing mean? And so these are the two photographers I want to talk about. Joseph Kudelka, who was born in then Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic or Slovakia, who is a witness. And I'll go through this relatively quickly. I'll give you two figures from the history, from the history of photography who have enormous relevance today. In 1968, Kudelka becomes a witness to the Warsaw Pact-led invasion of Czechoslovakia during the Prague Spring when Russian tanks crush the attempts by the Czechoslovak people to gain their own independence and freedom or have some more freedoms. 
It's a, hist a, a moment of historic, world historical importance, 1968, and he's thrown into this as a young photographer. He's been a photographer, and he becomes the witness to the Prague Spring, to the Russian kind of led invasion of Czechoslovakia. Obviously, that resonates with us today when we're seeing Russian tanks, you know, in, like basically on the road to Kiev. He publishes a book called Exile, Not Exiles. I apologize for that. Much later, 20 years later, in 1988, and I will talk about two things. The fact that he's a witness to the Russian-led invasion and what he does after that when he leaves Czechoslovakia and what his role becomes as a photographer then. And the second person I'll talk about is Ernest Kohl. Same time period, 1960s, South African photographer who is a black South African who reclassifies himself under the perverse laws of the apartheid regime as so-called colored, and photographs life in South Africa during that time. I don't like to say life under apartheid, because it means that apartheid dominates all parts of life, and actually Ernest Cole wanted to photograph life as it is lived by individual people who are not entirely and fully dominated by that kind of regime. Ernest Cole becomes a witness to apartheid, publishes a renowned book in 1967 in the US after he'd left South Africa, which will actually change the way the West, especially in North America and the US, relates to South Africa as a country. And then he publishes, then he comes to America and photographs afterwards. So Kudelka leaves Czechoslovakia, brings with him the testimonial images of the, of the Russian invasion. Ernest Cole leaves South Africa, brings images of apartheid. They both settle in the West, one in the UK, Europe, the other one in America. What do they do after this act of witnessing? And I'm interested in this. How does a photographer stay committed to this project of witnessing? And they both produce works that are very challenging for their host countries, for the so-called West that's a refuge from unfreedom. So I'll just start you out here. This is the first picture, which will become a very, very famous picture. Um, it's in Prague, in Wenceslav Square, which is the middle of Prague. If you've been to Prague, it's a square. It's totally empty. There's an arm, obviously, blocking your view, which means there's a human being in the picture. It's a watch. It's time for something. The time was that at noon that day, people were supposed to come to this square and demonstrate for freedom. This was a false flag operation by people who worked with the Soviets to lure Czech citizens into this square so the Russians could crack down on them. Czech people figured this out and didn't show up. So this is a moment when history is happening because no one showed up. So it's actually interesting already. This is a moment of incredible historical importance with no one in the picture except that, um, that, that um, fist with the watch on it. One of my friends said, Shelley Rice, with who I teach, she said, it is also the time starts ticking for the end of the Soviet empire. This is a very big triumph for the Soviet Union. Ultimately, they will crush the Czech, the Prague Spring. But at the same time, there's something happening here. It's as if history suddenly has a moment when something new starts to happen. And I think this picture is rather, it's a really beautiful picture, really evocative. It gets published later on. It will become the first picture of the book Exiles, published 20 years later. But this picture doesn't really make it out. And you have to remember at this time, people took photographs. It took days, hours, days, weeks to print them, to get them published. They weren't published instantaneously on social media. So this is an act of witnessing that doesn't have the kind of instant um, play in the world. And I want you to remember this gesture right here, looking at the next pictures right here, which is a different kind of hand gesture. And photography of witnessing really often operates on capturing human gestures that are almost universally understandable. Probably not universal in every cultural context, but you see right here, this citizen of Czechoslovakia is stretching out his hand at Russian soldiers sitting on their tanks in a gesture of either defiance or protest or say, stop. Stop what you're doing. You're the same age. You're the same people, ultimately. What are you doing to us? And the hand gestures, I think, become very important in these pictures here because they're communicating something, either protest, resistance, or defeat, in a very simple way, in a simple, in a human way. Gestures usually are the most operative dimensions of, witnessing, of testimonial witnessing. So I just wanted to give you the contrast between this hand right here and these hands right here. This picture right here 
is blocking the view. If you look at the first picture with the wristwatch, he's blocking that kind of, and this one is kind of barring diagonally, sort of setting up the scene. These are really evocative, amazing images. There's something happening in the background, probably smoke or something. These soldiers are just bored sitting on their tank, and this young man is agitated, yelling. It's another important dimension of um, photographs that, from what I've seen and from what I know, um, and I've written about photographs of the civil rights struggle in America, about black and white students trying to integrate schools. Photographs of Tiananmen Square in 1989 in China. There's an enormous amount of pictures of people screaming. And since photography is a silent medium, it invites you as a viewer to fill in something. You're immediately drawn in thinking, this person is very animated trying to communicate something. What is that? So from within the picture, there's a kind of silence that begs to be filled by someone else, by historical significance, let's say, by your interpretation. And so some of these pictures are pictures that Kodelka takes. So right here, there's a young man in the front in his leather jacket with a soldier, machine gun pointing at him, and he's opening his jacket in a gesture of shoot me. Do what you really want to do. And we are now in the position of seeing these two young men in a kind of confrontation, people clamoring out, climbing out of this tank. But he's saying, shoot me because history will bear witness to me. What you're seeing today in Ukraine, when you see President Zelensky in a t-shirt putting himself in the line of history and saying, my body will stay here, which two weeks ago we couldn't have imagined. And he's saying to all the European leaders and the world leaders, I will stand right here in the line of fire, my body. So from you're seeing from, and you as viewers right now, we are behind this man right here. Are we backing him up? Are we on his side? Would we put ourselves into that position? Most likely not. I think it plays into a kind of, and I'm doing this obviously pretty fast, but I want you to just get the gist of the kind of um, dynamic dimension of Kodelka's pictures here. Are we putting ourselves behind this man here standing here in a position that is really from another world, which is the position of a hero and a martyr, of someone who puts himself on the line for a greater cause, which is what we are going through right now. There's a greater cause, which is, I'm saying from another time, the, the philosopher Hannah Arendt would have said, it is from a period that's not modern. Heroes, martyrs, sacrifices. That is not a modern political categories anymore. These are coming from another world, let's say, the world of literature and myth. Another dimension of these images, and I'm only going through this um, to show a few formal elements because a lot of you, I think, are art students or photographers yourself and committed in this way to communicate something. Pictures of witnessing often include witnesses. This woman has seen something or is seeing something that we cannot see. So a lot of times, pictures of witnessing are not focusing on the, on the event, but on the people seeing the event. If you've seen pictures of 9-11 in New York City, and I happen to have been in New York City on 9-11, a lot of those pictures of the most effective ones are people staring up in disbelief. And you are now thinking, what are they seeing? And the picture does not include any referent to the historical event, but it includes something to a referent that remains incomprehensible to that person. So it's not that we could say, oh, she saw this. We can describe that and define it. This is the actual event. But all we're seeing is someone has absorbed something visually that they can't quite make sense of. So the picture draws you into a scene of incomprehension, of a kind of seeing that doesn't immediately lead to knowledge. And that, as a viewer, I think, puts you in the position to say, I probably would not understand what she has seen either, because it overwhelms in some category or some way. Um, we should talk about the gendering of pictures of witnessing. It is very frequently women who are depicted as witnesses and men as agents in scenes of historical importance. It's very important. That's just, let me just point that out. It's maybe obvious to you. And these are scenes from Prague um, in the days following that. And I'm showing you these pictures to explain a few of the formal elements. And the other one is also to say this is ultimately, in a certain way, a failure of witnessing. Kudelka's images, a few are smuggled out to Germany. People are not really interested. They don't get printed. Nothing happens. The Russian tanks roll in. The West says, 
it's hard to do anything, a few sanctions, we don't really know. And Czechoslovakia will be ruled and dominated by the Soviet Union for 20 more years. So in some ways you could look at this act of witnessing as failed because it didn't intervene and change the world. When, when I started out this talk saying, what are pictures of witnessing? You think those are pictures that changed history, right? One photograph that galvanized the world, that made people see we have to intervene here. That's the idea we have. And I wanna say something else that actually the failure or success of witnessing is not necessarily immediate. It is not that the picture changes the world's view of something, but there can be a longer effect. Kudelka's work is much longer than this one moment in time in 1968. This is a picture, and I just wanted to bring this one in because I'll show something in Ernest Cole's photograph, which is something I found more in Ernest Cole than in Kudelka, but also in some other pictures from Tiananmen Square. They are pictures where the visual plane is divided in two ways. Or very clearly, people sitting on one side, side or another. And I'll show you an Ernest Cole's um, uh, image in a couple minutes. There's something here that I think photography has this incredible capacity, which painting does not possess and literature does not possess, that you can capture people who inhabit radically opposed worlds in the same physical space. You can photograph people in the space of six to eight feet, two to four meters, who are in violent conflict of who ought to belong in this space, and a photograph can capture them at that moment. So the photographs I've been quite interested in for a long time are photographs of this desegregation of schools in North America and the United States in the 1950s when black students and white students are not allowed to attend schools together. And there's a drive, as we know, that ultimately results in changing the law. It has not resulted in desegregated schools in America entirely. They are entirely black schools and entirely white schools in America today. That's a whole other story. But some of the photographs from that moment show people who completely believe that the space in which they're standing is defined by them and they have the right to define who belongs there and who does not. And two meters away from them is somebody else who says, this is the same physical space and I have every right to belong in this space the same way you do. So the photographs can capture in a physical space and in the frame of the image something that are two different conflicting ideas of a shared world where the world is shared up to this line. You can come into my space up to this space. And those spaces are not spaces I mean which other people have done, Kudelka does work later, on walls and borders and fences and kind of physical geographic markers, but on the division of a world inside your head. These people don't belong, these people belong. This is, I just took this picture of Tiananmen Square because he's just one of my favorite people in photography. I always ask my students what this guy stands for. It's Tiananmen Square and he's the icon of freedom. He wears Nikes, he has the old universal peace symbol and he's speaking like in the other photograph. What is he saying? He's addressing both people's army of the People's Republic of China and his counter protesters in the back. We have all the other witnesses who are not witnesses. They're just civilians in Beijing. And I just wanted to put this in, and I'm sorry I'm scrambling your historical view a little bit, but these are just four episodes of witnessing in history. Tiananmen Square also, you can say, like Kudelka, a failed act of witnessing. The student uprising in Beijing did not succeed, depending who you ask. If you're asking students who were in the uprising, they think it failed. If you think people in Beijing today, they think it succeeded we crushed the anarchists who were gonna destroy China. Another perspective, China became more oppressive afterwards. Two different perspectives of an outcome. So in some ways, when I say they failed, I have to be very careful to say whose perspective am I assuming, and so how do you assess a kind of act of witnessing? But let's go back to Kodelka here. Um, and these are images here, which I think this image also puts a kind of um, iconography at work that is very readily available to us and we understand almost intuitively. And I think a lot of pictures of imaging have to work on this level, uh, sorry, pictures of witnessing. They cannot convey an enormous amount of complicated information. Who belongs where? When I was looking through pictures yesterday from Ukraine, I can't really verify who is wearing what uniform. I have to read the Guardian's captions and think, okay, who is this, what is this? This is five soldiers in the middle of a street. I don't even know what army they belong to. So in some ways, when you're doing this work, that is not what I consider. That is documenting, that's providing evidence. 
That is photojournalism, which is very powerful and important. It is not witnessing in the sense of drawing you as viewers into a scene where you are compelled to make certain kind of moral determinations of who is an actor in this scene and what kind of conflict is being played out. So you have this kind of um, statuesque woman, the amazing profile, uh, who looks like a kind of icon of sort of stoic maternal presence, the bemused, indifferent soldier on his truck with his gun between his legs, thinking, lady, what do you want? We're here, we have power. You're just having your hand on our truck. And then people in the background who are looking at the photographer at Kudelka, which is interesting, who are passers-by. So I think as a viewer, you have to take the scene in very, very quickly. Are you the people walking by in the background and not paying attention? Are you with this woman who's protesting and claiming some space for herself that will not be granted to her? <clears throat> or are you going to assume, well, the soldiers, they have a truck and a gun, they're going to win out any, in any case. So there's three different moral places. One of spectatorship, maybe indifference. One of engagement as passivity, to stand still in a place where there's movement, troops, tr tank, uh, tanks, trucks, soldiers, to stand in a place, because what's being demanded of the Czech people here is to leave that place, to yield to the invading forces. And she's just standing. So the immobility in the center of the image is an active immobility. It's not passive, she's just standing there, a woman who can't do anything. She's actually taking a position by not moving. Then these are pictures that Kudelka didn't publish in 1968. They didn't appear until much, much later, but they are the kind of moments that be made him very famous and, into, and made him into who he is, which is not only the witness to the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia, and that is what I want to get to. So here you have other pictures that I said earlier, the kind of gendered sense of what are they looking at us? Well, an easy answer would be they're also looking at us. They're drawing you into the picture that you as a viewer, you can say, well, I don't know what they're looking at. I don't have this information. I can't make these determinations. I don't know enough about Czechoslovakia. I don't know enough about Ukraine. I can't get informed enough. I can't read the whole history. They're looking at us. They're saying you actually are implicated in a scene where something is happening to people that is threatening or overwhelming or, and I use this word cautiously, traumatic, and we are now in the position on the other, of the other side of that. Are we going to do the work to bother to find out what happened to them, or are we just going to move on and say, well, probably awful what happened to you, but I can't decide what that was. So I think by seeing people who are witnessing atrocity, we are put in the position to not fill in that information entirely. We can't resolve that um, experience for them. Another position right here, sort of the gendering aspect I'm kind of interested in. Here you have three positions again, actually four positions at least. <coughs> you have the soldier in the middle. You have the woman in the front who's turning around, looking at something else, although there's a tank right in front of her. So you're thinking, what else is going on here? The tank would be a pretty disturbing and massive thing in front of you, one meter away, but you're looking around, there's other things going on, so the picture opens up to another space already. By the other woman with her back toward us, so the picture opens up, gives you more depth, which all I'm saying is we are now included in the scene because one of them is looking in our direction, the other one isn't, so the picture has another dimension. If everybody's looking in one direction, you as a viewer also just look in that direction. Here's two directions, plus there's another position in this um, picture, in addition to the photographer, of course, is all the people in those windows right there who are either spectators, we don't know, so in some ways I'm just saying there are different lines of sight and one line of sight leads to us. It puts us in the place of something is being looked at here that's not just the historical event, but our role in relation to that event. Um, this is a picture from yesterday. So I just wanted to give you a picture um, which you can't really say much about. You really can't say much, and part of what I actually want to convey to you, it's, um, it's a silent picture. And yet we know it's, it's, it's a woman who is not communicating by communicating to us something. And part of what I'm trying to do today, you know, I, I don't want to rush through these pictures and say, here's my grand theory of what witnessing is. Part of what I'm trying to understand for myself, and all my work is really just an, understand, an attempt to understand, how do we actually treat such pictures 
with the respect they deserve, to give them the space they reserve and not absorb them in another flood of images, communication, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. We cannot just move on, and we do that all the time, like all of us. We scroll through our phone and say, oh my God, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? There's another one. As if more information would stop the course of history. We can talk about that later, what, I'm, what I mean by that, and I think, how do you actually arrest this kind of flow of images and don't become numbed and overwhelmed, but give someone the space here, which would be a recognition of her in a moment of deep shock and loss. And, you know, I've written a lot about this. There's nothing to write and say here. You just want to create a kind of space for people to be, um, to be seen respectfully and not, in a sense, as just fodder for our own sense of being numbed or overwhelmed or, or the kind of sensationalizing, or my friend Karen Finley, who's an artist, said on Tuesday, the casualizing of war. There's so many pictures. It's just a thing. It's the background. You have CNN running in every airport lounge and every bar here. It's like, oh, more pictures of the war. Let's switch to a soccer game. I've done enough war for the next 10 minutes. So here's... Um, more scenes, and this is kind of, I think, where I end with the Kudelka, when the first image is the kind of picture with a watch blocking your view in a certain sense and saying, yes, something happening, there's an intervention, there's a human being who can actually say historical time stops or starts here, and here are other ways of intervening, and as I said, um, from a certain perspective, you could say these pictures are useless, they failed, they didn't stop the tanks, so what's the point of all of this? And we'll get to Kudelka afterwards. So this is the Tiananmen Square, very famous Jeff Widener's picture of Tank Man in Beijing. I just want to say we have an iconography in our heads already. We have seen pictures like this. And what does that mean to us? They say, oh, Czechoslovakia, Beijing, Ukraine. Similar picture. Tank Man, stop. And the man who's called Tank Man, uh, who climbed onto that tank and talked to the Chinese person, um, we don't know who he is. We don't know what happened to him. He's a real person in China, but supposedly he actually walked away after confronting this column of tanks and disappeared into the crowds of Beijing. I like that there's a kind of witness to history who didn't have to take that terrible role of becoming a sacrifice or, or a martyr to history. And then Kudelka publishes his book, Exile in 1988. Um, so he spends 20 years. So this is all I want to focus on. So he comes out of Czechoslovakia. He gets a chance to go to England. Uh, he arrives in England, he goes to Magnum, photos, Cartier-Bresson meets him. He's kind of hailed as the witness to the Prague Spring and the Russian invasion. And then he puts this picture in the front of that book, but this is 20 years later. So what does he do for 20 years? So Kudelka's options were several. One of them was to become a world-renowned photographer, the witness to history, he, is, he was called the photographer of the invasion of Prague. And that could have been his role. And he was really good at it. He could have gone to every other conflict and said, here's Ireland, here's this, I'm going to photograph this. This is going to be my career. And I'm committed to the truth and I want to help liberate people. This is what I'm going to do. A very morally defensible position. And Kodelka doesn't do that. When he's taken in by Europe, and this is what I'm interested in in this next project here, he goes to Europe, and this is the kind of pictures he takes of people who are actually disconnected from their surroundings, not people who are deeply integrated by their routines, their structures of feeling, their life habits, their languages, their traditions in this homeland. But he's greeted as a refugee from Czechoslovakia, poor heroic Joseph Kudelka, he made it out, we're going to give him asylum. So he's granted asylum in the UK because a year after the Prague Spring in 1969, some newspapers, New York Times, Herald Tribune, published some of the images and he realizes the Czech secret police are going to figure out who I am and they're going to arrest me. So he has to get, he gets asylum in Europe. So we're in Portugal right now. So you're in the good part of Europe. I grew up in West Berlin. I grew up in the good part of Europe. So this is granting asylum to somebody who comes from a war-torn country. And it's supposed to make us feel a little good about ourselves, right? It's like, oh, we took him in. We took Joseph Kodelka in. And what do we want him to do? We want him to keep on reflecting back on the bad Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, and we want him to be a little bit grateful. 
to think, well, you now you're in a free place. You're in the UK. You got asylum. You work for Magnum. He could now start selling his photographs for a lot of money. He's never sold his photographs. Godelka makes these books. He's a very complicated and interesting person. And what I'm saying is he becomes a witness to Europe as a place not just that grants people rights, but a place of deep obligation to create connections. And what he sees in Europe, I think, is all these people in these situations where they are doing things that are grounded and rooted in traditions and culture and yet seem almost disconnected from the backgrounds in which they're photographed. He photographed theater actors before in, 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 in Czechoslovakia before he left, and some of them look like actors on a stage who are put there and say, do this, and the background was supplied in some other way. They're bizarrely disconnected. And then all these pictures here, you can look up in the, in the reference to the book Exiles, where they were taken. In the pages, you have no idea where they were taken. They're just people in random places. This is in Palermo, I just put this in here. This is in a mental institution. These people are not dead, but we don't know that. But this is a picture, if you imagine, this is someone who arrived in Europe, was granted asylum, and he turns his camera around and says, this is Europe. That's what Europe looks like. A lot of people who are actually not at home here, who are not connected, who are not deeply grounded, but actually are taking this place as just a setting where they are housed or held for a moment. And what I think is really remarkable about Kudelka is that he doesn't have the position of the person who's gotten refuge and asylum and is grateful to his host place, all of Europe now, and behaves really well. He actually continues being a witness. So this is Kudelka in 1983. This is, oh sorry, I think, wait, where's the other Kudelka? This is in 1984. So he doesn't sell his photographs. He doesn't get a real job. He doesn't have possessions. He doesn't rent an apartment. He wanders all over Europe. He lets people sort of help him out. He sleeps on the floor. He gets one grant that's supposed to finance him for nine months. It lasts for something like four years because he's super frugal, doesn't pay anything. So he becomes a nomad voluntarily in Europe. When the promise was, now you found safety, settle here, make this your home. And what I think he's doing is he's actually photographing Europe. This picture to me is just an amazing picture. It looks, it's, it's the background looks like a stage set. There's this kind of building that stops halfway through the picture. Someone is doing some festival, shooting up this little rocket. The other people seem both engaged and not engaged, and the person in the center with his back toward us is not even a person, just a kind of black silhouette. A lot of Kodelka's pictures have just these silhouettes as if something, they are illuminated from one side, but we can't see them at all anymore. They're just figures, kind of shadowy, spectral figures. So what I think he's doing is he's remaining true to being a witness, and what he's seeing in Europe is an uncompleted and an unfinished project, not the place that people who gave him asylum think it is. Here's home, here's freedom, here's safety, here are all your rights. And he says, no, Europe is a place of deep obligations to create connections. And to me, this resonates very powerfully today when I do think Europe and the rest of the world, I happen to live in North America, is reckoning with the fact that we live in places such as Porto or New York City, where we have a lot of things that are guaranteed to us, a lot of rights. And we are realizing we have a deep obligation to explain those things, to keep on improving those things, to make them available to more people, and to defend them. And defending them is a really big deal, to say Europe is a place of obligation to defend the values and the practices with the monumental caveat that in the name of those practices and promises, a lot of terrible things have been committed through history. So how do you reconcile that, that Europe is now just suddenly tasked, not suddenly, it's not sudden at all for anybody, to say Europe has to explain what its project is, has to pay for that, it is a deep obligation without saying Europe has been the greatest thing forever. Because it's been the most terrible thing for many people in the world also. So we can talk about this more, how I try to keep this kind of dialectic in mind. And I, these people, to me, this is what he finds in Europe. 
everywhere, people who are both weirdly engaged in enigmatic activities that have some kind of ritualistic significance that creates community, and yet they're utterly disconnected from anything around them. So uh, here's, uh, this, is, this is Europe then, and this is Europe now. They're pictures of solitude, of disconnection, and yet, one important thing, when I say Kudelka is ungrateful, he's really a bit of a bastard. He comes to Europe and they say, here, we give you, we grant you asylum. And he's like, well, F you, I'm going to turn around and show how disconnected Europe really is. He's not a nice person. No witness in history has ever been nice. And this is the, a, a great temptation to say, oh, we, you're going to witness to your suffering, and once we grant you freedom, please stop doing what you're doing. Please don't be a witness anymore. Just be a witness to history and testify to the terrible things you've survived and let us know we are in a better place now, which is very morally consoling. We say, oh, it must have been awful in Czechoslovakia. Thank God you got out and you're with us now. And he says, no, 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 I'm with you. Look at what you're doing. So he's staying a witness true to himself. And so I'll go on to, um, so this is Europe. Uh, this is also Europe, <laughs> project in the making. This is also Europe. With They're just, to me, just amazingly powerful photographs of what he is seeing. He's just looking around. And he never wants to be settled. So Kudalka lives in Paris now, but he never really settled in Paris. He doesn't become identified with that. And then this is a picture I just wanted to show you. He includes that in exile. Um, because I'll conclude the talk of Ernest Cole. Witnessing does not only mean witnessing to atrocity and suffering. Witnessing also means witnessing to joy and hope. And I'll show you in Ernest Cole how he moves from witnessing cruelty, suffering, and injustice to saying, I'm as much a witness to human connection. So this picture, yeah, like for its, uh, like we could talk about this later. So I'll go to uh, the dedication. This is very important. So Exile, he dedicates this book to all who have helped me since I left Czechoslovakia. Without them, many of the photographs in this book would not exist. So while I've called him an ungrateful person in Europe, He's deeply grateful and dedicates his book to individual people. So giving up or bearing testimony to the project of Europe as an incomplete project in need of reparation or kind of continuation doesn't mean he's dismissing the people of Europe. So there's a double gesture of both saying, I'm going to turn my camera on Europe as this place of isolation, loneliness, alienation, and I'm going to dedicate the book to individuals. To me, this is a very important moment. Without that, the book doesn't work at all, because without that, the book becomes a kind of bleak, hopeless book of Europe as this terrible place of disconnection. And he said, the whole book is staked on connection. Um, the little promise from Walter Benjamin, which I love because he writes about Central Park, where he never went, because all of his refugee friends are settling around Central Park. He never leaves Europe. Redemption resides in a small crack in the continuum of catastrophe. Wouldn't that be nice, right? That's a small crack some opening somewhere. But without that, what are we looking at today? What are we going to look at CNN all day if we don't believe? In this catastrophe, there must be a crack. There must be an opening for some kind of hope. OK, so we'll move to Ernest Cole. Am I OK on time here, where I'm in the middle of it, kind of? Yes. So I'll just give you a moment to breathe. If anybody wants to add anything, raise your hand like this, like this, any way you want. Um, so I move to Ernest Cole. Same time period, 1960s, South Africa, ruled by a white supremacist government. He is subjected to certain laws, inhumane laws, that, that categorize him as a person of color, a black South African. And he publishes a book, he, as he gets out of South Africa with all of his photographs and slides. The way Kudelka gets out of Czechoslovakia, they literally have a bag, two years apart. It's 1966 he gets out, 1968 Kudelka gets out. They're bringing testimony of a system of unfreedom and injustice to the free world. So that's why I put them both in the same talk, and I'm really interested of these witnesses. They say they're witnessing history. Both of them also fail in the sense of apartheid isn't over the minute he publishes his photographs. The Russians don't leave Czechoslovakia the minute these photographs appear. Long term, something changes. But they both have this kind of strange parallel. They're coming from this place of unfreedom to a place of freedom. So in 1967, he publishes House of Bondage, a South African black man expresses in his own pictures and words the bitter life in his homeland today. OK, if I was an editor, this is not a title you give to a book. I mean, 
So what is being done to Ernest Cole? He comes out with these images. Random House publishes his books. It's an amazing book. It's one of the great books in photo history in the world, House of Bondage. And they give it a subtitle that couldn't be more blunt to reduce him in a certain way to say, a black man exposes in his own pictures and words the bitter life of his homeland today. It's so melodramatic and bad that it's also very powerful in its kind of badness. But okay, we'll show you. So this is another title for this picture. And this is where he, he writes his own text on his call. There's two essays. On his call, trained as a photojournalist with Jürgen Schadewald, who's a very important uh, South African photographer. And um, people categorized as black in South Africa and not allowed to work as journalists at the time. So he comes into the dark room at night and Jürgen Schadewald lets him actually learn how to print photographs or to take photographs and eventually becomes a photographer, although he isn't really officially allowed to do this. And he takes photographs and then in 1965 he starts realizing he took a bunch of photographs of these street gangs and the police want him to reveal the names of all these people in the street gangs so it's too much pressure so he's lucky to get out under a visa to visit Lourdes because he's Catholic and he has to go do a pilgrimage so they let him out religious exemption and he gets out of South Africa, goes to Sweden then America, never returns to South Africa because the South Africans revoke his passport. So he doesn't have citizenship anymore, so he becomes, he is granted asylum ultimately. He says, 300 years of white supremacy in South Africa has placed us in bondage, stripped us of our dignity, robbed us of our self-esteem, and surrounded us with hate. We think about the Walter Benjamin quote, how do you produce something out of this awareness? This sounds very absolute and kind of a blanket kind of statement, and he'll make two other statements I'll get to in a second placed us in bondage, which is a word from the Bible. House of bondage is actually from the Old Testament. Stripped us of our dignity, robbed us of our self-esteem, and surrounded us with hate. So he wants to bear witness to a form of resistance that is both political and also visual. Stripped us of our dignity, robbed us of our self-esteem, and some of the pictures he starts. So I'll start you with these pictures here, which are sort of daily scenes in, in um, uh, South Africa in the 1960s. So they're kind of scenes of daily degradation, for example. People had to have these passes uh, to move around. So they had to go to work or they had to go home. They had to have a pass and show them all the time, which just restricted movement. A lot of the policies of apartments to severely restrict movement and to impose an enormous burden on everybody who wanted to go anywhere who was black. All non-white, or actually importantly called non-Europeans. So here's a scene of a black police officer checking this, this uh, young man's pass and a white guy with his hands in his pockets looking on, people looking on. Um, I'll show you just some daily scenes. This is a very powerful and important image and uh, Ernest Cole writes a lot about this. He said, transportation was a form of actually depriving people of a basic human right, which was to make it to work on time or not. It was hours of overcrowded trains, buses, a totally dysfunctional system that was designed to systematically disempower people, disadvantage them, and also, what he said earlier, rob them of dignity and self-esteem. However, in this image, I think it's very important. There are people who are looking back fully where they're being photographed, and I think what Ernest Cole wants to do in his book also this is not just a testimony to suffering, but it is a testimony to dignity and to self-esteem. And I, I've written about this elsewhere, how Ernest Cole ultimately will focus on individual beauty. This, I'll show you something before I get to this, okay. Here's a picture of a white guy punching this um, young black boy. Uh, so he photographed these kinds of scenes at night of uh, Totsis, they're kind of gangs of uh, young kids who, who would rob pedestrians. And Ernest Cole sort of wanted to photograph these scenes. So he photographed these scenes of random street violence, of course, with zero repercussions for the white man who just punches a black kid. So this is the beginning of, I wanted to give you a sense of House and of Bondage, which is a very complex and long book, but I had to give you a bit of a, the idea of what he's doing. And then, remember I showed you in Joseph Kudelka how sort of um, spaces divided. A lot of Cole's work is these kind of spaces that are divided both by law and by assumption and behavior. 
sometimes there's no fence, there's nothing. People just know not to step into that space because they were they are socially told this is not the space for you. So here's non-Europeans only, Europeans only. Um, we are in Europe right now. The South African apartheid regime used the category of Europeans, not of white people. So Ernest Cole calls it white supremacy. They called it Europeans, non-Europeans. Um, so here's this scene, Europeans only. So this happy lady sitting in her remarkable, amazing privilege of living in a world that is so violently oppressive to everybody who doesn't look like her. And I think what Cole wanted to show is how happy is she in this situation? Just leaves you with that. There's a kind of, you could sit next to her here. Would you even want to be part of this? I think Cole is getting to that in his book and in some ways he's photographing white people sometimes and saying, these people look as miserable, possibly more miserable than other people in my community. But that's um, right here. There's a rope in the middle of this picture. So on the right, people are looking. They're looking at a performance, an event, a sports performance. Uh, look at this lady in the middle with her great smile, so happy, sitting on the white side of the rope. But the nice thing is, People on the other side, on our, on, on the pictures, whatever side that is, on the other side of the, they're also happy and unhappy. They're engaged, but there's the world divided into two categories. And Ernest Cole wanted to just show what does it mean for people to live on two different sides of this world. We can go into, here's another way. This picture is actually divided horizontally. So in the back, there are all these pictures, all these people crowding on the train platform to wait for a train. Why are they so crowded there? Why don't they just stand in the front? Because they're not allowed to stand in the front because that's for white people. And here's many pictures of that, of transportation, where there's an incredible overcrowding of one area, and there's almost no one in... There's no line, there's no fence, there's no nothing. And he wanted to show how a world can be segmented and regulated and divided through people, in people's minds, through conditioning behavior, of course, through incredible brutality and violence and threats, uh, and reprisals, but at the same time, he said, the photo can capture that, which people actually have to enact in their daily routines all the time. So here's a lot of these pictures, which I found just remarkable. This is another picture with the dividing line, and there's the picture of people waiting in line to get their papers to work in the mines. So all the gorgeous diamonds in the world that are produced largely in South African diamond mines and gold mines. So gold and diamond industry was one of the major industries in, in apartheid era South Africa, purchased all over the world for a long time, you know, purified by big companies who then resold them and resold them. And after they'd gone from Johannesburg to London to Antwerp to Paris, you buy them in a Paris store, you don't know they came from those mines. And here's two different groups of people all standing in line on the left having their traditional blankets. On the right, already photographed, the, some guys still have their blankets around them, but there's a kind of producing of a subject. And this is sort of interesting, sort of, they're, they're made into workers, and their clothes are sort of, they're taking out of sort of more traditional kind of areas, rural development, they're brought into these kind of industrial places, and then they're made to dress. So visually, you can see who's already on the side of getting employment and who's just being signed up. And Ernest Colt snuck into these mines sometimes. He was a little guy, kind of clever, and he would literally just sneak in and pretend he was trying to work there and photograph and then sneak back out. He had a camera hidden in his coat. It was totally dangerous and illegal to photograph any of this, and he smuggled these pictures out. I'll end with these pictures from House of Bondage, and then I'll get to what he does afterwards when he comes to the United States in 1967. They're also pictures of testimony. So I said earlier, he bears witness to the brutality and atrocity of life in South Africa. So what does this picture show us? He has joy, playfulness, humor, and they are people who are not supposed to be even in the same space, as you saw in previous photographs. And they're actually interacting, touching each other, breaking all the laws, both explicit and all the assumptions about what life in South Africa is like. And this book, House of Bondage, was reviewed in the Washington Post and the New York Times, won some award in December 1967 when it came out, and they said, it is a testimony to suffering and atrocity. And then I thought, wait, what about this picture? This is a testimony to joy and maybe even love. 
which is not supposed to exist. So if you think a book of witnessing to atrocity only documents human atrocity and suffering and only reduces people or elevates them to the status of victim and martyr, you're missing something, that actually life is more complex. And I think Ernest Cole wanted to document life, under, life during apartheid, not suffering only, which would have reduced people to their conditions that, they are, that are produced by the law. So there's one picture, this is a very beautiful picture. I think there's a lot of identification. Ernest Cole has a few pictures of children studying especially. And um, I have a South African colleague, Tabitha Moha, who, told, who said to me, she said, oh yeah, she said, that's like me. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, that is like me studying. And there's another picture of another boy and they have one light bulb and they have one hour of electricity at night, and everybody had to agree who could study tonight or could somebody actually sit up and have dinner with light. And she said that was normal life in the 70s still in South Africa. So she grew up in South Africa, and she said, this is about a child who is actually, and I think the kind of intensity and focus and the kind of openness of a child to want to learn something, to discover something, and he's sweating, obviously, sort of, it's very beautiful to me, and, and, and kind of, and I think there's a, that's how Cole saw himself, in a way, Honest Cole, sort of, as this person who wants to know something about the world against all these obstacles. This is a very moving picture, I think, of a woman who is a um, live-in maid or housekeeper in a white house, so you would photograph in these white homes, these black housekeepers, and this is a moment of respite I think incredible dignity in her bearing, kind of, and since she's not looking at us but letting us in, and she allowed him to photograph her in this moment, it's a kind of moment of openness and vulnerability. Um, so I think in this picture book, which, as I said, has been really characterized and celebrated as a book that documents suffering and oppression, I think it is wrong to say this is a picture of suffering and oppression. I think it is also a picture of incredible beauty and dignity and that witnessing has to have this dimension to, you, to reach the human psyche, let's say. Beauty, dignity are certain categories that have to be utilized. And I can show you some other pictures, so this is one more. Um, I actually think Ernest Cole had a real eye for human beauty. There's something very peculiar when he takes pictures of the mine workers. Occasionally, there's someone looking at him, and you realize there are people who are just incredibly attractive, humanly attractive, which is a category we don't really use to say a picture of you testing, you providing documents of the oppression of the mining industry. And then Cole would pull out one person who's just an attractive person. I'll, I'll point this out because it, it resonates later on. So then. Now Ernest Cole has come to America. He goes to Sweden, the Hasselblad Foundation, the Hasselblad Foundation, which owns all of the archives, which will not give this archive to the descendants of the Cole family today. It's 2022, they're holding on to them, there's a big dispute, and the Hasselblad Foundation said, well, we own this archive, you can't have it. It's a very esteemed, wonderful place in Sweden, and it's keeping possession of pictures made by a black South African photographer whose family would like to have these photographs today. So there's a whole controversy going on about the Hasselblad Foundation, so God bless them. They gave him a lot of opportunities in the beginning. 50 years later, they are not exactly giving those pictures over to the world. So that's a <laughs> side comment. So he says, I want to focus my talents on other aspects of life, which I assumed would be more hopeful than apartheid realities and bring some joy to it. The total man does not live one experience. He's molded and shaped by the diversity of other experience into some form of the whole man. So he's a witness. Kodelka was the witness, the photographer of the invasion of Prague. Ernest Cole is the photographer of apartheid. He becomes celebrated. He's calling the world's conscience to say, you have to take a stance against this. And like Kodelka, he says, I won't be reduced to this. It is a reduction to reduce me to this historical figure of I bore witness to this terrible thing that happened to me and now I'm in this free country. So this free country, so he says, recording the truth at whatever cost is one thing, having to live a lifetime of being a chronicler of misery and injustice and callous callousness is another. And such matters about the only assignments magazines here in the US want to offer me because the subject matter of my first book happened to be centered on a race issue, the color of my skin, another incidental matter and the fact that I endured and escaped the living hell that is South Africa. So the magnanimous West 
wants to keep him in this position, say, you are the black photographer who bears witness to the suffering of black people in South Africa, thank you very much. Please keep on doing that. And he says, don't you see how you are reducing me to a position that actually I tried to escape from through my photographs? That being the witness is not this static place of here's injustice and here's freedom. So then he takes photographs in America. None of these photographs are ever published. The Ford Foundation gives him two grants. It's 68, 69, 70. 69 in 1970 in America is a very important period in the American civil rights movement, which started several hundred years ago. Civil rights movement did not start in America in 1955 with school desegregation. It did not start with sit-ins at lunch counters in the South. It started a long time ago by people of African descent who fought for their dignity and their rights. The civil rights movement is not, oh, 1960s, now we have civil rights ideas. Like this is hundreds of years of African Americans and people of African descent fighting and demanding equality and their rights in America. I think it's very important to know that, not to think, oh, this started a revolution at that day. It's like the women's movement didn't start in 1963. The women's movement started as soon as women were on the planet. In some ways, I think these historical definitions are really in error. And so, so he photographs America, 1971. He's now living in America, in the United States, and he takes photographs, first of situations in American black communities that he, like let's say here, a guy who's super drunk or passed out or high or something with these two little kids playing behind him. So these kind of contrast between life, joy, innocence, and a kind of life that seems to be going nowhere uh, in front of a liquor store. Uh, yet pictures not lacking in dignity. I don't think they are in any way um, demeaning. This picture right here of a dude right there on the sidewalk next to this whole um, accumulation of garbage or boxes, or maybe it's his shelter, we don't know. You know, it's not just garbage, and above they're real rich and long, so it's sort of Winston cool cigarettes. So you have the image of America selling African-American identity as um, sensual, good, and exciting, and the reality of some African-American dimensions of life as poverty, and these photographs are never published, okay? So he wants to sell them to American magazines, and they're like, no, thank you. We do not want to see actually what happens in America. This is a photograph he takes in the South. It is not a photograph from 1859, before the Civil War. It is a photograph from 1970. People picking cotton in the South, okay? So this is an image that you could think literally, is this made for a movie about the plantation system or something like that? Somehow American news editors are not that interested in these pictures. Now, why is that? Ernest Cole says a sentence that I think is so offensive to most editors in America. He says, what I saw in the American South is worse than anything I saw in South Africa under apartheid. Americans are not super excited to hear that maybe what's going on in their country is worse than what this guy who survived and escaped from hell and we gave him asylum and refuge and he should now be appreciative and say thank you so much, I can be a black man in America, thank you, thank you. And he doesn't say thank you, he uses his camera, he says I'm a witness, I'm gonna turn this camera on what I'm seeing and wow, what I'm seeing is racism in America, it's atrocious. So the Ford Foundation gives him these two grants and then, um, oh, this is a, and then he takes these pictures also. And I want to end with these pictures. So when I said, what a witness, what Ernest Cole wants to do, he wants to bear witness to America now in the 19, early 1970s, like Kudelka, who wants to bear witness to Europe. Kudelka's image exile is, book exile is very strange because there are very few pictures of joy, of love, of dignity, the words we don't really use when we think about historical events. Ernest Cole makes those words into key concepts of what his act of witnessing can be. So he photographs these people. This super cool guy with his transistor radio right here in a kind of littered street with people hanging out in the street in New York City. And he had a real eye, I think, for people who actually are absorbed in an activity and 
are for a moment at peace with themselves. He's not struggling. He's not defined by saying life is unjust and a horror because actually he's like having a good time playing his music. Uh, these two kids right here with a BB gun, like a little gun, having fun with a gun. Okay, this is a guy who bore witness to the incredible oppression by police and police brutality in South Africa, and then he comes to America, and then he photographs really difficult scenes of African-American life, and then he photographs this, and they're having fun, and there's two people in the background who I think mirror, there's two people in the foreground. As a photograph, it's kind of genius. They're already older in the background, they're younger in the foreground, and that play is an important part of life, and not everything is reducible to seeing it through the lens of hopelessness, of what Benjamin calls the continuum of catastrophe. There's something here. Here's a crack of redemption. Maybe these boys will actually get along. They're friends or brothers. Um, this is a picture, again, from the book on apartheid. This is apartheid. This is not supposed to happen. So he's opening up something. He's opening a vision of humanity within this kind of ongoing crisis that I think is remarkable, and th that's what he wants to activate. And then this is why I showed you this picture right here. So he photographs these black and white couples forbidden by law in South Africa, right? Um, in America, he also photographs black and white couples. Really interesting, what I said earlier about the space that's segregated in your mind, that you can step to this place right here and you can't step over the line right here. This is the other line in American culture. Um, in 1966, in a U.S. Supreme Court decision called Loving versus Virginia, the United States Supreme Court finally overrules the state uh, prohibition on interracial marriage. There's a couple called Loving, of all things, in Virginia, and they actually take their case to the Supreme Court through a lot of different steps, and they actually ultimately granted the right to stay married in the state of Virginia, where it has been illegal for black and white people to get married. Hannah Arendt, who gets something massively wrong about race in America in her comments on the school desegregation, massively wrong, who thinks schools should be segregated. No one should impose on kids how to live their lives, and if the state doesn't want them in the same school, no problem. She's a great philosopher and made a great mistake. But in that same article, she says, the one thing where the state must never intervene is love relationships and romantic and erotic relationships. It is an outrage that interracial marriage is prohibited in America. That is a private function of, us, of our lives and it should never be regulated by the public. But you all know, you in Portugal, you know what it would mean to marry somebody who doesn't have a European passport, right? You all know. So Hannah Arvins would say, that is an outrage that marriage is linked to those kinds of rights. Should never be considered like this. So then Ernest Cole, and this picture is really nice because I think, so you're in the position of us right here. Yeah, we all think this is just awesome, right? This couple, they look kind of happy. She looks a little bit apprehensive, not totally sure. They're on the subway in New York. And look at the guy in the back. So what's his expression? So he is white America. He's like, seriously? She's dating a black guy? He is actually the other person who is sort of, Ernest Cole is standing over here looking at this. And then there's this whole row of people who are sort of indifferent, sort of the subway as this amazing place where people have to be together who don't really want to be together for a moment for a short ride. And then the guy in the background who's sort of his hand in his pocket and he's like, this should not happen here. So I think in the picture, he really quickly tells you this is not an easy, totally comfortable scene, but there's someone else looking who is not approving. I think that's what he tried to capture. And then I think this is the same couple. I'm not totally sure. I couldn't figure this out yet, but these pictures are never published. They're pictures that Ernest Cole wanted to leave us with and say this is what he also wanted to document, the incredible brutality of racism in America and a certain kind of hope. And I think this may be... Oh, yeah, this, I just wanted to end with Ernest Cole, who... And this is how I... You know, it's um, a melancholic ending. So Joseph Kudelka, I told you, decided voluntarily to be a nomad. Not to have a home, not to buy an apartment, not to sell his photographs, not to become famous. He slept on people's living rooms. He traveled around. He really slept outside for much of his life. Very strange and bizarre person, right? I mean, who would do that? Ernest Cole comes in, in America, tries to find a footing, gets these Ford grants, tries to sell photographs, keeps on being rebuffed because people are saying, no, we don't really want these photographs. We want you to just maybe republish some stuff from South Africa, but what you're doing now, we don't really want to show that. So he makes no money. 
he actually ends up, he has a lot of health problems. He's in and out of the hospital system in New York City, which is vastly inadequate, as you know. He's homeless, and he dies in 1990 on February 19th. He dies a week after Nelson Mandela is released from prison. It's deeply moving. He could never return to South Africa. He was too sick. His mother and one of his sisters came and saw him in hospital uh, in New York City after he'd been homeless. He would lived in a subway station for a while. He has a few friends who keep track of him, but he's really kind of lost to history. So he's this amazing witness to ending apartheid, which ends 20 years later or whatever, 20 some years later in 1990, Nelson Mandela is released from prison. That is the end of apartheid a few days before his death. And when he writes a, he writes a kind of autobiography, the most re one of the remarkable things I thought about him, Ernest Colt said many times over the 20 some years when he had left South Africa, he said, I knew black South Africans will be free. I never had a doubt for one moment. And people said after 25 years of boycotts and efforts and struggles, he said, I never for one moment didn't think my people would be free. And he dies right after he realizes that, which is poignant in a way because he dies way too young. And I leave you with this thought. So I thought, okay, Kodelka, Prague Spring, it doesn't help. The Soviet tanks roll in, stay there, occupy or control Czechoslovakia for another two decades. Ernest Cole comes out of South Africa, documents apartheid. It takes 25 years to end apartheid. So are these pictures ineffective? the first set of pictures, right? Are they failures? Or did they gradually change the world's mindset? House of Bondage is really credited with changing the minds of people like Robert F. Kennedy, who gives a very rousing, important speech in 69, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a kind of long-term impact of witnessing. And the other thing I wanted to leave you with to think, okay, so some photographers are thrown into the cauldron of history and become witnesses to a historical event. What's remarkable is that something in them compels them to bear witness to the world and not, this is the event I was sort of happened to stand in front of and I'm gonna become a witness to that, but they stay witnesses to the places where they end up. And I think the thing why I was, had been thinking about Kodelka, although I sent Daniel the picture for this talk a couple of weeks ago with the wristwatch and then I didn't, like the rest of the world. I didn't know what was gonna happen, like nobody knows. And I thought a lot about um, Kodelka's work as a much longer project, not just the Czech, the Prague Spring, but saying, okay, he is bearing witness to Europe as a place that creates enormous obligations. Ernest Cole created photographs that we now have some access to, but not a lot of access. They haven't really been sorted through and published. Um, a few of them has been, have been published that he bears witness to America also as an ongoing project, as something open-ended. And what he takes away is the kind of smugness and comfort that is comforting for us to say, we live in these safe places. We can let these people from hell come out, survive, speak to us, and they're gonna keep on looking back. Instead, they're saying, we, these two uh, photographers say they come into our places of safety, of security, of a certain kind of stability, and say, we're gonna turn the camera on you, to say you are the ongoing project. Your presumed place of refuge and safety and comfort and security is the ongoing project, not what happened in history in the past. So maybe I'll leave it right here and then uh, if people have comments or questions. Um, thank you, thank you very much. We will now open the session to a Q&A uh, space. Please feel comfortable to pose any questions, add some comments. Yeah, you can do Q&A and C, like comments or observations. <laughs> you don't have to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Do you need a microphone or something in the audience? Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for for uh, this experience. I'd say, in both thought and and a aesthetical experience, um, I have two questions, completely different from one another. 
first one is from the get-go you you clearly define the distinction between or the dichotomy between witnessing and documenting and my broad question is does witnessing exist without documenting without context for example most of the images you showed here you provided us with context where where they were taken what was the the situation um you 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 invited us to think about what people there were experiencing but that that is an interpretation can be more or less factual but the question is more more or less um on these terms because you also p alluded to the concept of truthfulness along um your lecture and that was uh, very interesting uh, as as i was wondering if uh, is photography supposed to be truthful or invite us to think and create fabric fabricate ideas and and thoughts um because as it's a still it's something not moving is something that has has to be contextualized in order i i was assuming for for the entire the entire time contextualized documented in order to get to witnessing get to be closer to the truth that's question number one i if you prefer i can post question number two uh, although it is entirely different okay so it's about uh, a stance you took i even hesitated on asking this question because it's a bit provocative but it's about uh, uh, you took the the stance of the omniscient voice of the status quo in in telling us about um, Kudelka's life and after uh, he, s he or after he was not embraced by European institutions let's say and you were saying oh so you were s you were not supposed to do this you were not supposed to bear witness to us you were supposed to tell us how it was bad back on the other side and I, I found it funny because uh, when when you drew the parallel with Ernest Cole's life you provided us with some some quotes and some of his of, of his life stories and it left me thinking um, this too could be a fabrication what the, the voice you were saying like was it really an intention is, is there any documentation just to use the word on how uh, Kudelka was supposed to act, or was it, um, or w was it maybe an individual choice? There are lots of, of examples. Uh, it got me also thinking, for example, about um, you spoke on the European project and embracing individual liberties and uh, critical consciousness. For example, uh, the School of Frankfurt which did exactly uh, the insider critic of society at the time, of the society that um, in which they sought refuge in. I don't know if this, this one is clearer. Now, so these are the two, the two questions I wanted to ask. First of all, documenting and witnessing, and, and second, what about uh, Kudelka's own um, choices and the influence on his life's work? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. They're great questions, and you kind of answered some of them a little bit yourself. Uh, let me say the first one, that the categories are probably not as clean as one would like them if this was a purely formal analysis between evidence, documenting, and witnessing the way I use it. Let's think about a picture where you actually don't have any context, but that's a very dramatic scene of a, an interhuman conflict where you see, because we know how to read certain images, there are weapons, there's positions, there are gestures of defensiveness, of aggression, and we have no idea what's going on. That could be a, t a form of an image that calls upon us to become something like witnesses or to function like people who have a particular relation to the scene as a moral conflict where you cannot see all sides in the same way where you actually say, here's an aggression, and I don't think that's right, because this kind of aggression, no human should be subjected to that. Um, so what I'm saying is that witnessing can involve a kind of moral 
or spiritual dimension, to use terms that are not used in political science or in journalism, that draw you into a situation where you're taking a moral position on behalf of one or the other places. It's not documenting all positions. They are not all equally valid in your moral universe because you're creating a moment to thinking, what is going on here? Um, a child being beaten by an adult that can provoke a kind of moral response. Say, this is not just. There's an imbalance of power, so no matter what happened, what did that child do? This child is being punched. You have a more, so your moral position is not related to the context, saying, well, the child did these things, or the history of that, or, or et cetera. The, all the context, I think you're right, I provided a lot of context. Because my point was not to show sort of pictures and make you keep, let you keep guessing, but to say, sometimes you're called into a, inadvertently, assuming a moral perspective of an image that can be undercut by the documentary evidence then, that you can learn about the context and say, well, I get all of this wrong, actually. There's a very famous photograph of a, an African-American teenager and a white policeman in the, South, in the American South during the Civil Rights Movement, and there's a police dog on a leash that is jumping up at this African-American teenager. This picture looks really graphic, it's a horrible picture, but it's not quite what it looks like, actually. The dog is not attacking the teenager. Something else went on there, we have a lot of documentation, we have testimony from the teenager, he said, no, this dog was not attacking me, I was running into this police officer. So, the moral position is one, but the documentary evidence could contradict that. So I think your question is really good to say, it changes things, of course. And I wanted to provide some context. Also, I have a particular interest in these images, um, and I have a particular perspective that's my perspective. And I think it's important to think, okay, pictures can be helped. We can learn a lot by learning about this historical context. But there are some moments that, no matter how much historical context there is, I think, you can't explain away maybe your moral outrage or your sense of compassion to say, well, this is not right, someone is beating a child. No matter how much context you put on there, you can say it's still not right. So, so I'm, I'm saying you, so context usually, documenting usually overwhelms the picture, will explain things away or actually clarify things to a point. And what I tried to show in those pictures where the women are looking at something that we don't know, um, it's kind of a common photograph for witnessing atrocity. What I tried to imply is that we don't know what happens on the other side, and we'll never know. We can't say, oh, this thing happened, that was terrible. What happened is they maybe experienced a loss that is not describable, that, is, that cannot be turned into, oh, this happened. I mean, when I show you pictures, I could show you pictures of September 11th in New York City. You see lots of people staring up like this. They're not even seeing the same thing. They're seeing a tower that's about to fall or that has just fallen, and they're seeing very different things, be we know, because they, are, they will have interpretations, they will have relationships to this. But what I'm saying is we can't totally account for what they're seeing, say, okay, I'm gonna give you the entire history of what happened that day. Because it was traumatic for people, and I wanna keep this moment of trauma as a kind of openness to something that cannot be filled in by historical knowledge entirely that cannot just be sort of saying, we're gonna explain it until we understood every last remainder of it. That to me is connected to the openness of photography for some kind of hope, that a new interpretation could emerge from that. And it's not this happened, this is what led up to 9-11. That something here can be, there's an openness in the, in the event itself, a kind of obscurity that the photograph then puts on you to put on. And whatever interpretation you're gonna come up with what's happening, you're gonna be in one mindset and someone else can say, that's not what happened. This is not what happened. This wasn't just an outrageous act of aggression toward, this was also other things. This was also a, an appeal, a cry, a protest. This wasn't terror, it was terror. All these definitions I talked about at the very beginning, you're gonna put those definitions on by document, by providing evidence, but you will ultimately take a position what's happening there, There's, this is an act of aggression or an act of defense. You will take a position, and I'm saying something has to stay open in there, and photographs can keep that open for a moment. And the second question, um, oh, the kind of omniscient voice, yeah, no, I'm just a critic, I'm just looking at some pictures, I'm trying, but I do actually think um, photographs, 
when they're effective, they actually they make an appeal. They f have a form of address. They actually demand a response. And all I try to show is, um, you know, I'm like all of you, I presume. Maybe some people have another answer. I would be curious. I don't know what to do uh, when I go back to where I'm staying. And am I supposed to turn on CNN for another eight hours and then BBC and then... China Daily, and then maybe Russian TV, and then maybe get something else, and then look at Le Monde, and then look at five other news channels to get a real picture of what's going on? Is that, so my question is, how do we respond to the appeal generated by certain images? Um, the short answer is, Kudelka gives us an answer. He basically says, don't keep on staring at the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. Keep, in, keep on working on creating Europe as an ongoing project that actually creates more places for people to settle and find a new home. There are two major texts on exile. Czeslaw Milos, the Polish poet, wrote a great introduction to that book, and he says, exile is the 20th century condition par excellence. The 20th century has produced so many people who are stateless and refugees that that's this general condition. And then Michel Frizeau, who is an amazing photo historian in Paris, he's written a book about the making of exile, of that Kudelka book, and he says, exile is a universal condition of our supermodernity. He uses that idea by Marc Auger, the French anthropologist of Les Non-Lieux de Mémoire, these non-places of memory where memory doesn't settle, where rituals don't anchor us. Those are universalizing interpretations and I think these are correct, and yet Exile is a book that says, as Europeans, we or you <laughs> have an enormous obligation yet to complete. He sort of opens it up into a project of the future. Ernest Cole says, don't keep on looking back at apartheid South Africa. Look at your own country right now, what has yet to be done. So I think both of them give us a way to say witnessing is not just this kind of passive staring at images until we are numbed or overwhelmed or something like that, but to say you have to do something where you are. That, that answers maybe partly your question. So, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, sure. Um, for example, Ernest Cole, as you said, was was um, refused by institutions, by magazines, by editors, um, and the the, the the omniscient voice part was was were there institution voices refusing uh, Kudelka's uh, work? Were they saying this is not your role? In our society, in this side of the barricade, your role is not to continue what you're doing. It's not about what they're trying to convey, it's what, what was expected of them. Good. And that was Good question. Question. Slightly different. Kudelka kind of opts out. He's with Magnum. Cartier Bresson is his great mentor. He keeps on talking to Cartier Bresson. He's, they're really funny anecdotes, so Cartier Bresson will show him some book, and he says, bad, 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 bad. Kudelka criticizes all the images. Says, one good picture, maybe, the rest is really junk. <laughs> sort of, and you're thinking, really, you're gonna criticize Cartier Bresson? Kudelka opts out, in a way. Very strange choice for me, personally. I couldn't do that. Ernest Cole is refused entry. It's very different. He gets in, but he tries to actually connect and sell pictures, and they won't buy them. Kudelka doesn't want to sell pictures. He makes this book, very complicated story, really amazing story. There's a publisher in France who really pu pushes him. But there are two different options to your question. One is actually a voluntary partial opting out, and the other one is someone who never quite gets in. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, I was wondering while you were answering uh, Francisco's first question, uh, I would like to ask you about the idea of failure and time frame for the photographies, because I was thinking about the work being done by Aisha Ariela Azulay about the sounds of rapes that, can, that she's imagining or synthesizing uh, from the photographies uh, from ruined Berlin in 45. 
So you have, she's making this really interesting uh, research on from those photographies, so no sounds, and imagining or filling up the gaps of those photographies with the sound of the screams of uh, women, women being raped. So I was thinking about use the term failure or, uh, or images that can fail or they, they can fail to solve the conflict or the episode that they refer to. But that failure can be always, can only be like sort of a meta state, right? They can always find some sort of re redemption or a crack in the future wall. Uh, they're always functioning you know, in a way or another, right? Because I, I was a little bit confused with your term failure, right? Yeah, so um, I meant failure originally in the way you just said, kind of, they fail to intervene directly in the event at hand. They can't change history and there are other moments when actually pictures do quite a lot. So um, during the breakup of Yugoslavia and the Bosnian conflict, there's an image published in the New York Times in an advertisement in 90, probably 95, whenever that is, of people in a railroad car. It's, a, it's not a passenger car, and the doors open, and there are women in there with handkerchiefs and a few children and in these kind of patterned Eastern European outfits. And it says, let's not stand by passively the way we did during World War II. And it's by the American Jewish Federation, and it's clearly an image saying, let's not stand by while this genocide happens in Europe, which was the Holocaust. And the image looks like a picture from 1942 of Eastern European women being transported on railroad cars to the death camps by the Germans. So I saw that photograph as an ad, and I said, this is remarkable. That is an appeal to the American government to intervene. And as we know, Bill Clinton will ultimately intervene in the U. So there's a really effective way to make people think, oh, we saw these pictures before, and we failed to act. This time, we're going to act. That would be a success. I remember I was, I lived, I've lived in America for such a long time. I lived in America, and I thought, wow, remarkable. And then I came to Germany to visit, and I said to this friend of mine, yeah, in America, we're all looking at this and saying, this is another Holocaust. He said, what? And I said, isn't that the way people understand it here? He said, no, no one actually wants to make that analogy ever. That's totally, you can't make that analogy. And so I wrote this essay for a German newspaper, and I said, this is how America sees the pictures. And the Germans were like, what? These are totally different pictures. I said, well, they look the same. You really cannot, if you don't like talk to your question, if you don't document, you have no idea. They're just women in a railroad car being transported somewhere against their will. So that looks like 1941, 1994. So that was an effective way of witnessing through photography because it was a direct appeal to the American president through a picture. If you saw the movie Selma, Ava DuVernay's movie Selma about the civil rights movement in America, Lyndon B. Johnson is the president. And there's a kind of voting protest in the South and a, an African-American woman is beaten up because she wants to go vote. And the pictures on the cover of the New York Times, above the fold, which when the New York Times was a paper, you know, above the fold means you see it right when you get the paper. And Lyndon B. Johnson says, damn, now I have to do something. Because one picture showed something that the US president couldn't ignore. So I think there are pictures that have this kind of role. I don't think it's ever one picture, but it could change the way people see things. So that's what I meant by failure. But your question is really the time frame. Eventually, Czechoslovakia gained its freedom. Eventually, South African apartheid ended. Much later, did Kudelka and Ernest Colt's pictures play a role in it? Absolutely. Were they the one galvanizing event, that one turning point? No. So I think sometimes there's too much pressure put on one picture to say, we're going to see this today, and that's going to change the world's mind. I mean, if you looked at Vice President Kamala Harris today, and uh, when she's, she's in Poland, she said, what we saw yesterday on TV is inexcusable, unforgivable, we must investigate. So it's based on an image that she's watching on CNN. So I think in spite of all this, like photography is malleable, it can mean anything, we can make, we can fake any image. You still have world politics being decided and being driven by images. And those images, I think, are importantly, they have a tradition. That's why I kind of really briefly alluded to, there are certain kind of standard images we see, a tank and a person in front of a tank. 
We get that. You know, the crushing state apparatus against the individual citizen. So I think certain conventions are in play, and that's what I'm interested in, like wh how failure is defined or is success. And you had a second part to your question that I forgot now. Wait, failure? To, oh, the area of the I, 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 I don't know. I, ooh, uh, yeah, to fill in the gaps in the archive by imagining what, if I get that right, she's imagining the screams of women being raped. Okay, like there I would really pause and say, I don't know whether filling in a silence is actually the way to undo that silence. Another comment on Ariella Azulay's work, which is really important and powerful and uh, transformative, where I struggle with her a little bit, that Ariella Azulay imagines photography to create something that she calls a democratic space, where people in different identities, Israelis, Palestinians, are existing and coexisting in the space. The pictures I showed do not show a democratic space. They show unregulated spaces of physical coexistence, but democracy is not the concept. It's anarchic, it's contingent. The train station in South Africa, there's nothing democratic about that space. So Ariella Asley wants to imagine that photography opens this kind of citizenship of democracy, this dem democratic citizenship of belonging. I think photography doesn't open that up. Photography also shows geographic space is not democratic at all. Democracy is a version tyranny, anarchy, or other versions. So I, I always struggle when she gets to the place of the citizens of photography. I'm like, citizenship? No. People are deprived of citizenship in photography as much as granted citizenship. That's just another comment on Ariella. But the filling in the silence, uh, I have a hard time with that. <laughs> I think the where I'm interested, like I showed you some pictures of people who are screaming or trying to say, they, but there's silence. I think photography is a silent medium. It can be very powerful when you are called upon to imagine or fill something in. I think the impulse to fill in is maybe human to say, what is this person trying to articulate? If it's a scream of agony, I think something cannot be translated into comprehensible language, but it's very important. I think Ariella, is, it's the right impulse to say something is being said with, from within the photograph that we cannot know. I don't think we can totally know. I think that's what I would hesitate to say. We actually know. We don't know. And that openness can be, okay, what is being, to make a little bit of a conceptual leap, what are we overlooking and not hearing constantly in our daily lives? What is the things that you're hearing walking past constantly that you're just going to block out? That's, I think, what the photograph can maybe sort of say. There's something we are being addressed by certain things, and we don't want to fill that in or cover that over. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, we saw a lot of pictures of suffering, and uh, you even mentioned the uh, most recent events. And I wanted to know, in your opinion, where should we draw the line between documenting and benefiting from other people's suffering? Yeah. I think it's very hard to say what the... <laughs> benefit could, could be, I know what you're saying, sort of at some point there can be a kind of, it can feed our moral sense of like a momentary kind of um, moral enragement that sort of makes us feel good about ourselves, right? Susan Sontag in her book, Regarding the Pain of Others, which is an interesting book, says what you're saying, that line is never totally clear and we probably are doing both at once. It can motivate us to create some action. It can actually produce some good outcomes. It can also be a kind of self-satisfying way of just indulging at the suffering at a distance. 
and say, I can see this suffering over there, it doesn't really affect me, but at least I took an interest for a moment. So maybe the line can, has to be decided in every single case, and the, the, the way to get out of this maybe is to say, okay, how much of your consumption of these images leads either to nothing, to you not doing anything, or leads to actually your sense of kind of being numbed and overwhelmed, which is almost worse than nothing. And what part leads to you to say, okay, I'm gonna turn the TV off, gonna turn my phone off, and think about what is addressing me in my own life. That's what I'm struggling with with this, all these images. I'm saying I can't do certain things, so how do you actually do something in the sphere of your own life? You know, we are all affected in different ways, so how do you actually deal with the lingering effect of this impact of these images without thinking, oh, I, I kind of got something out of it? And benefit is really complicated because is the benefit supposed to be for you, for others? So I, I think there's usually both going on. You just don't want one to totally overwhelm the other, right? Um, and then there's also another part that <laughs> war sells. I mean, people are making a lot of money on, the, you know, this is, you know, great for CNN, right? Like, we always, like, there's that. That's also a part of the kind of, um, the reality of photography and images. There's a lot of money in it right now. You know, every time CNN, there's a bump in how many people downloaded or are streaming CNN, and they can sell their ads for more money next week, right? So this is directly related, so the benefit is also, could really be just a material benefit, and how do you resist that? Um, how do you actually pay for t citizen photographers, right? Which all of you are, all of us are right now. We don't have official Magnum AP, like Associated Press, New York Times, Herald Tribune. None of you are gonna get a job to be the permanent staff photographer for the Herald Tribune. Sorry, that job doesn't exist anymore. Please be a freelancer, gig worker, send us a great image right now at your own risk. You're gonna go there, no protection. You may have a press pass, but that's it. Go to Ukraine, photograph, and you'll get paid $100, maybe if you're lucky, 100 euros. There's also another benefit equation in here, right? Like, so actually the photographers are doing this work. They should get paid. That's a very real dimension of it. So that photographs are so easy to come by today and people are taking photographs at enormous personal risk. And then they're recycled and reappropriated and reposted. I think that's another part of this kind of question you may have. But the first question is a really, I can't decide. Of, I think there's, always a dimension of that. We look at images also because we want to be educated, we want to be better people, we want to know something. This is, there's a problem with that part, right? Um, Susan Sontag, in this book, she, one thing she says, which I found really kind of compelling, she says, compassion is an unstable emotion, meaning you kind of exhaust it at some point. If you just keep on looking at things and you feel terrible, she says, compassion needs to be translated into action or it will wither, it'll die. If you don't do something, you just keep on looking and saying, I feel terrible, I feel terrible, I feel terrible, it'll just go away because your mind cannot process that. But translating it into action, the action doesn't mean I'm gonna do something about that event. That's why I use Kodelka and Ernest Cole. Ernest Cole does not say, go back to South Africa, do this, but say, Ernest Cole says, do something where you are at home right now. Kodelka is not go back and protest the Soviets in Czechoslovakia, do something about Europe right now. So let's say compassion is motivated by these photographs, and then the trick is to say, for it not to just become numbing or go away, do something. It doesn't mean you have to do something directly about that event. This, seems, this may seem to you totally absurd, kind of like, wait, you're supposed to do something over here when this is the event that motivated you? Yes, I think actually that is one way to deal with it because you cannot do something over here in that historical event. You coming from literature? And well, it's a, it's a very, I will, I will try to keep it simple. Um, and I, when you were talking, I remembered Georges de Dubergman, images in spite of all. And that human, that human ambition, or that human comprehension, that somehow images are more irrefutable than all other types of testimony, mm -hmm. and how the the Jews that were inside, that were uh, in in concentration camps, they 
understood that taking photographies and smuggling those photographies out of the concentration camps were acts of resistance. Mm -hmm. And it, it was precisely those photographs that made, for instance, Anna Arendt mm -hmm. believe that concentrations were real. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel like, or what, you, what if you feel like commenting, how photography presents itself as a, a, an irrefutable testimony and, for instance, literature and the spoken words doesn't? I mean, the pictures you're referring to, so George D.D. Überman published this book, Images Despite All, or Lady Marshall Malgret II, about four photographs that were taken by resistance fighters in the Auschwitz concentration camp, unimaginable, in Birkenau, actually, of people who were being prepared to be gassed to death. They're really unimaginable photographs, very kind of with a handmade camera smuggled out in a, in a um, toothpaste container. They were supposed to then make the American president and the Allied forces intervene and bomb the train lines to Auschwitz. The Americans said not a priority, not a strategic interest, and never bombed any train lines to Auschwitz. We now know, whatever it is, 70 years later, we now know from photographs surveillance photographs taken by the American military that they knew where the concentration camps were, they knew where the train lines were, and they flew that far into Poland to actually know that. During the war, they said, we don't know anything. We can't, we have no evidence. So now we know through photographs. It's kind of, there's one, picture, one piece of evidence by Jewish resistance fighters who risked their lives in a terrible situation to document something. And these photographs never reached their addressees or people could intervene and said, no, well, let's see. And then other photographs now show they were lying, actually. They were really lying and said, this is not, and they weren't lying about one thing. They said, this is not of strategic importance to us to save the U Jews of Europe. It wasn't of strategic importance for, American ally for the American forces at the time. So there's two sets of photographs, and you're saying both of them present the truth, right? This is a tr true photographs of people who were caught and trapped in this, in this concentration camp, and here's military surveillance photographs. As we know from history, they can all be reinterpreted. So I think the evidence up to a point, and I think what the first question was about captioning, you can reframe a lot of things. Kudelka's pictures were, pho uh, the photographs from the Czech invasion were republished in 2008, 40 years later, by Aperture magazine. Melissa Harris did this great interview with him the editor, former editor of Aperture Magazine, and he said, my photographs now can show that this really happened because it will be forgotten. It will actually, as if it didn't happen, and there's eyewitness testimony, this black book by the Czech government, these huge amounts of documentary material to prove these photographs are evidence. So I think your question goes to sort of, are photographs inevitably invariable evidence of something? In many cases, yes. In other cases, however, they can be turned almost into their opposite. And you have pictures that are very clear. Here is the execution of civilians by a kind of invading army. If those pictures are just reprinted by the invading army, the victors of history in Walter Benjamin's phrase, they will be terrorist organizations trying to upset the state. And once you have that narrative, I mean, if you live in China and you're trying to Google Tiananmen Square, you're not going to see the picture I just showed you. And if you ever find it, it's going to be the people who try to destroy China. There's a dominant narrative, so I think pictures are evidence, and there's an enormously powerful effort in many cases to totally reframe the meaning of the image. Your second question is literature in, com in relationship to that. Um, you know, most presidents don't read poetry. No, uh, they don't the, read novels. But so in some ways, it's an effective way of witnessing, <laughs> but... But the question was, because there's a famous dialogue between Anna Arendt and her husband, yeah. where she was telling, oh, we were hearing people telling us about the concentration camps, but we didn't believe it until we saw photographies. Mm -hmm. As if, it, uh, as if uh, what people say with words leave so much space for imagination that we tend to believe, well, maybe they're, they're exaggerating, and photographies don't. 
I just wonder today whether you think... And she, ref and she refers to photography. But is this still the case today when we have you know, countless images about every event from every site? This may have been true at some point in history where you have one, two, three, ten photographs from a verified source. That's it. It's the only image we have. What about today when there's so many photographs from every angle? I mean, you know, people are flooding photographs constantly because they know the power of images. So if you actually photograph a scene and put different captions under it constantly, maybe Hannah Arwen is still mo operating in a moment when photo photography has this power. I'm not totally sure. And then another thing on Hannah Arendt. Arendt is a strange person in the way in which she sometimes lets her own kind of skepticism get the better of her. She constantly keeps on re rethinking her positions, and she's really an incredibly active thinker on things. I said this, and let me examine this and all this, and I think there's a moment, this would be a moment, when Hannah Arendt, she doesn't want to trust herself. Hannah Arendt, if she, the one thing she believes in is the power of literature to contain and give shape to human memory. She says this everywhere. But then she says, ah, literature, what is that? Sort of in, its, in a certain way, I think there's Arendt kind of against herself. I think she's not really... Um, look, she goes to the Eichmann trial, and there's tens of thousands of pages of evidence. And at some point, Arendt very famously leaves after 10 days and says, I've seen enough. Okay, I know, I know. She says, evidence is not what's at stake here. She says, I don't need to read this, and there's lots of, as we know, the, all the controversies about Eichmann, but I think there's a certain kind of, um, I would read as a kind of provocation and not her real belief. I don't believe she really thought photographs prove anything. I think she would say they prove our desire for historical truth and evidence. That's all. They don't verify anything. You know what I mean? That she's actually not, she's not um, to be taken totally 100% uh, at face value at this, in this moment. And it's kind of a question to turn back to us, sort of like when you see a picture today, do you actually trust that picture? You're shaking your head, right? <laughs> You'd be a fool, right? <laughs> You go ahead. <laughs> let, let him. Let him. Let him uh, <laughs> yes, we're going to go ahead. Yeah. I was. I was just thinking that uh, photographs uh, nowadays are the common ground of fake news. So, like, if you see a, a, a photograph, you never know which side took the photo. If it is a Photoshop, uh, who is going to appropriate towards the caption and its discourse? So it's yeah. But um, I, I want just to... But in, but in some ways, I think what we try to say, it's the ground for this huge debate of what's true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. And that is important, that we still invest images with this power. We say either it's fake or not. We, what Nuno's question is a little bit about, we invest still today photographs with this enormous power. So there's a huge dispute. This showed these people here in this place. No, it showed other people in this place. All of this, these, the captioning contest and all that, but what you're saying, I think it's, we are still very invested in that because in spite of everything, we actually still believe there is a truth. We actually still believe things happened. We actually still believe certain people did something, other people suffered something. So that photographs become that place, I think shouldn't be considered sort of, it's the age of evidence is over or the age of witnessing is over, saying it's actually become more acute for us. Um, so we need to learn certain things. So for example, the conventions of photography, if you photograph certain things in certain styles, people will be realizing they're remembering unconsciously other images they've seen before. Oh, okay, I've seen this. I've seen a tank, I've seen a person, I've seen a person standing in front of it. like I know exactly what's going on here. They don't know what's going on. So your question goes more sort of, what we have to do more work today probably than um, than we used to do yeah but probably we could move to where we started today at 5 p.m <laughs> before this talk and to the idea um even with these two fantastic and very thrilling examples that you showed us today to the to the idea of the importance of non-polarization 
because it somehow underlies the creation of these two photographers. It's not a question of, well, this is the right and wrong situation because, and you are the good ones that are taking me out of here. Instead, the situation is way more complex than that. Do you see what, what I'm, I'm trying I, to pick up here? Well, <laughs> no, there is a right and wrong side. I think what you're saying is really important. So in the beginning, we talked earlier today sort of how we live in a world of polarization. It's this perspective or that perspective, totally incommensurate. I'm taking a very moral position here. I'm saying, no, actually, these photographers bore witness to what I called injustice, unfreedom, violence that Absolutely, was Absolutely, but on, on the institutional side, and you showed us pictures of life, of cohabitation, and in that sense, it's way more complex because it's about human being. So it's not just the... It's uh, actually a really good point. The apparatus that it's at stake, yeah, as you said. Both of them didn't want to be caught in this role of only seeing their own life experience through one lens, which is we are the victims of these historical forces. They actually wanted to say that is a real trap to say, I am always a victim, or as Ernest Cole, in a very complex sense, he essentially says, I will not be reduced to my subject position to bear witness to my condition, and he says to this incidental fact that I'm a black South African. He calls it incidental. You could also say it shaped his life. It turned in, in, into an exile. He could never see his family again, et cetera, et cetera. All these things happened to him. He said, nonetheless, he said, I will not be reduced to this, and I will not speak only from this place of only being the black South African who testifies to suffering. He's also testifying to joy, to dignity, to life, to beauty, categories that are not the things that we usually we think about in political discourse. So there's a, I think what you're saying, they're opening up something that escapes this kind of absolute polarization. I say there's only one perspective on this. There's only one perspective on what Ernest Cole calls black life under, South, under apartheid. He says, no, I will show you what life is. And that is the part where he resists kind of the sort of the impulse by history to see only winners or losers, to have only one frame of it, to say there's only cowardice and um, martyrdom or, or courage and heroism. Because then again, in he's America, he the sees, question he of... He sees so many things no in America, it's just amazing. And he sees just things that are terrible and he sees things that are remarkably beautiful. It's just, it's like, you know, it's... Um, it's hard to resist, uh, in a way, to see it only from one side, to say, oh, he's this figure, this heroic martyr who, who just bears witness to one, one event. So Elie Wiesel, who became kind of one of the major figures of witnessing in the 20th century, who survived Auschwitz and wrote Survival in Auschwitz, who's kind of, he says constantly, Memory is the only way to resist a kind of complacency, what your question was about, about numbing, to actually remember actively what happened. And then Elie Wiesel, which is important, he becomes an advisor to presidents all over the world, and he talks about situations in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and he talks constantly about what's going on in the world. He said, I come from this devastating place called Auschwitz, and I bear this knowledge with me, and I'm this witness, but I'm a witness to contemporary history. So it's sort of a witness who becomes a, to, the, to the, the, the kind of temptation to see everything as saying this is a kind of hopeless situation. He says, I'm a witness to life. I'm a, I'm a witness to actually continuing life into the future rather than looking back at the past as this kind of lost event. I think Nunu was not happy that I didn't answer yet with the literature no, of no, photography. No. But, <laughs> I'm like but I'm very happy that we are having you here for almost a week so we can continue discussing with you next Tuesday because you are presenting uh, at the Cine Club. Yeah, I'm presenting the uh, uh, Monty Adiawara's amazing movie on Edouard Glissant. And, on the Glissant. and yeah. then on Wednesday we have you on our class for which you are all invited. And then on next Thursday you will be talking with, with Mantia. So... 
we'll, that's we can continue. So thank God next you. week you don't have to listen to me, but it's really about no, Mantia Diawara, so but which is really, no, but, but, but I actually can make. But I will torture you on my class. But I will say, that's my place. <laughs> I really appreciate your coming today, but come next Thursday, because Mantia is one of the yes. great and most wonderful people on the planet, really. He's just an amazing scholar, filmmaker, thinker, writer, novelist, but he's also just a lot of fun and an awesome person and a really good friend of mine. And I'm just, for me to be here with all of you, it's such a joy and an honor. And that next week I can be the little on sidekick Wednesday to Mantia is really, really great. So. And on Wednesday we continue the yes. testimony okay. and the witnessing because I'm not happy with your, <laughs> with your answer. That's Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.